This is the Land and Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Keith. And Matt Dye. We're coming to you right here on Sportsman's Nation Podcast Network. We have a very exciting podcast for you this week because we are rolling full steam ahead. Now, some guys down south have already kicked it off, but I know it's a hot topic this time of year across deer hunters and land managers and all sorts of land enthusiasts is food plots. It's April... 18th or 17th and we are in a very late spring this year yes. for us it's very i mean I, I was talking to equipment operator today and he was like uh, basically i told him i said if you were to take pictures of the landscape right now and then have pictures from march over the last five years you would say oh those pictures it just fits right in it yeah. looks like march here mm-hmm. um, dogwoods haven't even thought about popping yet or yep. just barely red, poking red buds are trying just par- barely poking through yep. and it's just there's like no leaves on the trees hardly at all um, other than the bradford pears and uh it's just it looks like march but it is what'd you say april 18th april and so 18th. we are gearing up and trying to figure out what we're planting and where we're planting and get that strategy developed because it's happening really really soon yeah, oh, for sure, and I and I think uh, this is just an exciting time. You're chasing turkeys. You're trying to get the food food plots planted, or at least get them prepped. I know several guys that have been out um, getting ready for that, and I'm still sitting here going, just not quite there yet. No, not not quite there. And but some people are. Some people are are getting seed in the ground, really finalizing their plan, or they're hoping winter leaves them so they can do start that process. So yeah. it's a great time to talk about food plots and food plots successes failures everything that that revolves around them yeah and i think i mean this is the third week in a row that we've had snow like this past week yes. we had snow for the third three week in a three row. sundays in a row we had snow of some degree and it was like man it is april get out of here winter there was a Leave. little bit of snow the night we were at turkey camp well it spit snow a little bit opening day like yeah. morning they're very very few flakes but it was at least cold enough, certainly cold enough, um, but just we had the opportunity to see it. It wasn't a welcome sight, but no. it happened. Nope, I do not enjoy it. And I froze. Oh, my gosh, I was cold opening morning. But while I'm thinking of it, for you guys, for the listeners out there, and we've asked for you guys to leave reviews on, on iTunes or Stitcher, but we've also added the review tab to our Facebook page. Yes. So please... If you enjoy the podcast, go to our Facebook page, Land and Legacy, and leave us a review, and that helps encourage us to continue doing this week after week, um, late at night, and you know when we're doing the grind, and we're like, you know, is it worth it? We oh, can it's read, worth it. Re- read your review and go, yep, that's why we do it. So please and go check that out. YouTube as well, because these podcasts are now being filmed by Zach Shermer, who was on here a couple weeks ago, um, works with Slate and Glass. He is producing these and filming these podcasts, so they're available a couple days after we release on Sportsman's Nation. So you can leave a review, ask questions there on YouTube as well, following up these podcasts. And you may not, may not think that's a great feature quite yet, but you will as soon as we really start showing the details of maps and things like yes. that. Yep. Um, if we're breaking down a property you will now be able to see us break it down and, and know exactly what we're talking about. So we encourage you to check that out and leave us a review over there, please. And subscribe so each time we add a video, um, you'll get notified that we've added a new one and you can check it out. Um, now, last week we talked about the first film. Yep. Um, that went over really well. We got a lot of awesome feedback from everybody. Um, we're super excited to continue making those and we've been filming those parts of those in the last couple of days. So more is to come now this week's podcast we've kind of hinted at it but we are going to cover the topic of food plots but it's specifically food plot failures the things that you do or don't do that causes your food plot not to be as successful as you had dreamed of Um, so you may have the big goals to set over a beautiful green field that looks like the tv shows and then you plant it and it looks like a lime green yellowish patchy yard that's been sprayed (laughs) with herbicide and has been the pigs have been put in there and just doesn't look like you thought we're gonna hopefully help you avoid those problems in this week's podcast who is this week's podcast brought to us by hunt maps 
Map the Hunt. And one other quick announcement. This coming week, so the this podcast releasing um, the sec- or third week of April, this is the opening week for sign up for National Convention at QDMA this year down in New Orleans. We'll be speaking there, um, doing a couple podcasts while we're there as well. Um, super excited to be going back this year. So if you haven't, well, obviously you haven't signed up, but if you haven't thought about signing up or planning that trip, make it part of your summer. Um, it's a great time down there talking with other uh, landowners, hunters from across the country. And it's a cool thing to take your, um, like we took our wives last year. We did. They didn't, yep. they didn't go to the show with us. No, um, they don't want to hear us talk. No. I don't blame them. And they uh, they basically had, I almost threw a little jab at you in there, but I didn't. Wow. I'm going to just go on through it. <laughs> um but they had a great time just going around and going to different things around the city oh, as yeah. well. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to take the family down and, and hang out while you're talking deer with us. That's right. So um, are you ready to kick this kicked off? And, Let's kick it. All right. So when I think of food plot failures, there's so many things. And well, frankly, we could probably there's probably a few things that you may occur, that may occur on your farm that we aren't going to cover in this. But we're trying to hit the main things that cause your food plots to fail. Yep. Number one, and and this one, everyone can face it and face that different times of the year. You can't control it, but it's something that we need to talk about because there's techniques that we can use to help avoid the catastrophic failures involved with this, and that is a drought. Yeah. That, to me, I think a number, number, numero uno. I don't think it was any surprise that someone, we said drought first, because again, you 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 just can't control it that's funny that, you're at the mercy because we're talking nature. about the things that you can do to help your su- be successful the problems to avoid but this is the, we kicked <laughs> off with number exception one. uh number one you can't control so uh yeah, yeah but it's the worst one. Oh, yeah <laughs> groundbreaking <laughs> right. um so the drought uh, that was a there, great pun you said groundbreaking uh, yeah, and that right. leads us into what you can i wish i could avoid. say i play in that yes yeah so drought is one of those things that of course we're losing moisture and I said groundbreaking. Um, one of the biggest ways that we can combat and fight off the drought is by not breaking the ground, not plowing and disking and turning over the soil. Because basically, every time we do that, we are releasing moisture and also exposing parts of the soil that were hidden that had moisture. We're exposing them to the sun, the wind, the elements to where they evaporate. So you are basically yeah. trying to, in a roundabout way, when you're plowing and doing that, you're trying to release the moisture that's in the soil. That's exactly what you're doing. I mean, we have both experienced and, and talked about on the podcast, we've we've plowed dirt before. Like we have seen, if especially on plots that are a little bit larger, you make that first pass around, you're like, oh man, look at that just beautiful turn dirt. Love it's that dark. smell. Yeah, that great smell. By the time that you're done with it or, or your four or five passes um, past that point, you can look back and see a difference in the color of the soil. That is a direct indication that I'm losing soil mo- moisture that fast. We're talking maybe 10, 15 minutes, and you can you can visually see a difference. And think about this two weeks after the fact. Like within the top layer of, of soil, especially if you have windy days mm. or just hot days, no mm. moisture, no dews. Like you do not have soil moisture, but that's the very resource you're asking to be beneficial for the food plots that you're spending money on to help grow and then you're wanting that forage to go and hunt over it just it's very counterintuitive when we when we put so much time and effort and money into that soil and into this food plotting you know ma- the management of food plots but yet we we destroy or or limit the success by disking and by the removing. very first thing we do yeah like yeah. we we start off with the we, we start instead of stepping with the right foot forward, we we just immediately go backwards. Yep. Yeah. I, I think of, uh, you know, I've said it, I don't know how many, you know, almost every podcast or every other podcast when I give the story about when I first started food plots, I definitely say it almost every time we talk food plots. But <laughs> I think back to, so like healthy soil, you think big black dirt, just mm-hmm. beautiful, um, have really fragrant. It's got a beautiful Rich. smell to it. Just, oh. Earthy. But then you look at unhealthy soil and it's like a gray or mm-hmm. a... And he's just like, oh, that we're just really look clayey right. soils. Yeah, it it's, just ugh. doesn't look great. No. Well, I remember years ago with all the plowing and disking we would do, and we would have to start in early August to prep for planting in late yep. August. Um, that 
and then if it turned off dry, which it does a lot here in the Ozarks, um, we would have exposed soil for several weeks, if not months. And over time, that happens year after year, we lose organic matter. And you can go to a satellite image, pull up the farm, and you see white. It looks like snow on the food plots, and it's actually exposed soil with no moisture. Zero moisture, just hot. It's baking. It's so again, baked. We, we've also talked about you know the, the biotic life that's in that soil, the microorganisms, mm-hmm. the bacteria. And when it's exposed to the elements, the sun, it cannot grow. It Basically, the environment is way too harsh for those um, species, that life to sustain. So you're killing all that. Again, that's asking um, the soil to be more productive based on that life being present, but you're removing immediately when you're exposing it those, to those elements. The wind carries away precious nutrients, topsoil, um, and then if it rains really hard, you have erosion issues when you're exposing um, that soil. So you can't control drought. No. Nope. But if you do not expose that soil, you can limit the amount of basically felt stress on that food plot. Because yeah. you're not destroying its layers that's built up over time to help infiltrate the right amount of water and, and keep it within you know, a healthy root system that's available for a longer time frame. Yeah. Instead of it either running off, never incorporating itself, or just straight infiltrating and getting to the water table and gone. Yep. It's held up in a layer that the, where the roots are, basically. Exactly. Yep. So... One thing I think we ought to talk about on this portion is rainstorms and being con- conscious of the weather when it's time to plant and the potential of, okay, I've got I've got this rain coming, this is forecasted, or I've got thunderstorms five days out, they're saying it's going to hit that afternoon. Where's like that gamble that like... Do I, do I risk it early if I know I have rains coming? Do I plant maybe a, a week or two earlier than I should? Or do I, do I bank and say, okay, um, in my area, I'll get a good heavy rain early that first part of food plot season, um, but I know I'll get some of those scattered storms later on. Like, I think that gamble is something everyone faces. Like, do I, do I go all in right now and plant with the first chance of rain? Or do I wait a little bit, maybe let that con- those conditions get a little bit better, warmer nights, um, warmer soil temperature? Like, in your opinion, what do you think is the best route? To me, I always base it off of, like, kind of just the overall average and try to say, okay, well, I know that it looks like... And, and I say that a little bit hesitant because last year... We actually debated this. Hey, we're actually getting rain in late July and a little bit of early August. Do we want to go ahead and plant? But then we were like, well, it's still early for us to very, get planted. And I don't want to plant early. something that, like, if you plant oats too early, they're going to go ahead and mm-hmm. head out. Or wheat's going to grow ahead and, and turn to a, a, a stem blade, a stemmy. Yep. And instead of a blade. And so <coughs> then it's not going to make it through the winter. Um, and it's, so it's like, okay, well, let's just hold off. We're not quite ready. We don't have all our seed coordinated yet. Let's just hold off. And then we held off, but then we, we didn't got get zero any rain. more rain. And so we missed it. And some of the guys that planted early in that, in that risky late July, they actually had some food plots. Mm-hmm. And so we missed it. But to me, it's always been, okay, just the average of, okay, this is the time to plant this time of the year. So fall food plots, I want to plant them in early or mid August or late August. Um, and then know that even in September, if I have a few little bit of cleanup or a couple little areas, I can still plant it and be successful. But that's kind of, for me, always the window. And when it comes to spring food plots, it's always May. I don't mm-hmm. like to get it in the ground in April just because there's always a chance to get that really couple really hard. Couple cold like snaps. this year, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare do it this year. Oh, no. <laughs> and, no. And, uh, and I remember it snowed May sixth i believe like five or six years ago Mm -hmm. and some of the and a lot of the people that had corn in the ground it was six it was up six inches and they all had to replant Mm -hmm. and they gambled with the early warmth we got but they got hammered with that late freeze yeah and so that's for me i always try to in our area try to be okay early to mid-may for for like soybeans here our food plot stuff um and even like with some of these other blends i'll even plant late may early june um, 
and now of course that's all variable because we plant some other stuff that we we'll even we're not even scared to plant in July if we have to. And that's the thing, like these these are your conventional. We're talking about conventional planting times right now. Yeah. You know, there's there's other species that you can use and help incorporate into different blends or, or different mixtures. Food plots in general are very very diverse in what you can do. These are the conventional times that most people are wanting to get seed in the ground for you know grain production you know later in the, in the fall and winter time but in general right we want to fall in that medium category don't want to risk it too early and and then if you get too late you really get spotty on some of those rains that um and this is uh, you bank on that just don't ever come the farmer gets such a there's some parts of society that really badmouth farmers but you think about it this group of people they base their livelihood off this gamble that we're this talking gamble. about. Every single year. Do I plant too early? Do I risk it? Or do I go ahead and wait and mm-hmm. risk the chance that I, I miss the spring rains? Yep. And they do that every single year. And every single year, they somehow still provide food for all of us. Yeah. Uh, and that and that's something. And then they get disrespected. And, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's just one of those things that I think is just... Whew, I, I, I It's terrifying to me to bank my livelihood off of that gamble. Sure. Of, because uh, if we'd <laughs> we'd been sure in a lot of trouble if well, our livelihood was banked on our choice last fall. <laughs> well, and and here's the other uh, gamble that they have is when they're getting crops out of the field too. So, you know, do can I get equipment back in there if I get too many rains? You know, in the fall time, can I get that crop out? So yeah. it's a it's a, a stressful um, livelihood. Yeah, for so, sure. Anyhow. Another big common failure that we see, and I think a lot of people experience um, unintentionally, of course, um, is overseeding plots. And yeah. I think I think the um, the common phrase, I guess, is, "Well, I'll just add more; it'll it'll be fine." Or if if you know, um, more is best. M- more is best, right? That that mindset. Um, but when it comes to seeding food plots that is definitely not the case at all no there's, there's a there's reason a we have recommended rates <laughs> yes yes i think sure. of uh turnips is one of those uh brassica species is one of those that just always comes to mind mm-hmm. when planting too thick because you look at turnips and you say oh it's a little seed okay tiny 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 seed. i'm gonna plant this it's going to take a lot of these to cover an acre but and if you look at the recommended use, it's like three to four pounds when mm-hmm. you're broadcasting. So it's like, okay, three to four pounds just per acre. That doesn't That's it? Seem Am I really like a cover? lot? Surely, eh, I want a few more. Yeah. And so, oh, I like them turnips. I want to see you, a big field of turnips. You plant them, and, and I, I saw this a lot as a kid when we were planting them, and we were throwing everything out by hand. Mm-hmm. And uh, you would see where like we threw it, and the main part of it would hit but then and they would be like really they'd be like one to two inches tall and they'd be turning yellow and no bulb yep. and they wouldn't wouldn't make it through the fall and then on the edge you would see actual nice size turnips you're like okay that's the rate we want to go with yeah and so that's a classic case and we see this a lot in the little bitty tiny kill plots that are like under the trees i'm gonna pack it in here where you're like well the heck with it I, i'll pack i i don't even know how to buy a bag for uh uh, they a don't tenth sell of an it acre. per tenth yeah. of an acre. They sell yeah. it for half an acre. So whatever. I don't want to leave the rest of the seed in my garage, so I'm just going to use it all in here. And it's funny because in that situation, especially, there's so much competition with trees around the edges, the canopy, the sunlight. Like That's a very competitive um, area and, and fighting for resources, again, with those root systems and the tree canopy. So if you're adding that many more seeds to... Um, the soil and and expecting to grow a great crop, you're going the opposite direction. So here, really less is more, um, and adding the additional or doubling a rate is not going to get you the stand that you're hoping to achieve. Yeah. What's so funny Sorry, there? I you're you're laughing over there I'm, oh. about my hat um, <laughs> that I'm wearing for the podcast. <laughs> uh, flat bill, as they said, because they know me, I don't wear those flat bills. So. Um, well, yeah. we, and we talked about this, the, you know, another podcast when we talked about TSI and we, we had the yeah. illustration of when you try and broadcast corn, you know, you see corn that grows too tight. It looks like it's a dwarf species of corn because there's so much competition, um, that with the root systems, you have ears that 
are very small, very, they look miniature, or sometimes they abandon the ears, um, they don't tassel quite right, because there's just too many, if you will, stems per acre, stems per square foot in this food plot instance, that they're not going to grow successfully. Yeah. And so reading and understanding the proper rates for each species that you're selecting to plant, super important, but then understanding their densities in a mixture is important as well. So if it's three to four pounds of pure turnips in a food plot, you don't want three to four pounds for turnips in a mixture. You have to cut it back proportionally to the other seeds in a mixture. And I think this is a shout out for the cutie may on this. If you're looking, if you're kind of just interested in food plot um, species, a really good book is the quality food plots. I had to turn and look. Yeah. Uh, it's in here, but quality food plots, um, it's a QDMA book, and it has all, all kinds of great information. It's a great thing to check out. Um, if you're watching it on YouTube, you can see Matt holding it up now. Um, but it's a it's a really handy book to kind of look through in the back, and it gives all kinds of different species and and talks about the poundage per acre and and different things. It's just a really it's a great guide. Informative, yeah, it's it's basically like Bible of food plots. Right, right. So, so understanding seeding rates super important easy way to fail easy yeah. way to fail with food plots um the next one that we're going to talk about is poor seed to soil contact and i think yeah. this goes back to how we start the podcast with disking and and how oh my gosh i gotta expose that soil i gotta get my seed to soil contact just right i've i've got to be able to um you know get that get that contact and cult pack and firm it up and do this and that um but if you go about this process in the wrong way, you can go backwards again instead of going forward. Um, so one of those is broadcasting in too heavy of a thatch. If you're trying yeah. to start a new food plot, talk about that for a second. I, I think of uh, a couple times where I've tried to plant a new food plot in certain areas when I was younger. That was like uh, it was a it was a fescue pasture, but like. I was planting it because cows weren't in there. So it was like, okay, I'll just spray it. It hadn't been grazed. It was I'll just, thick thatch. Thick, thick. And I'll just spray it. I'll broadcast it. And uh, we'll just hope for the best. And it didn't come up very well at all because the seed basically set in that thick thatch layer never actually made it to it the got soil. caught up. And, uh, yeah, so it was basically just throwing seed in the bushes and hoping for the best. And so I... I failed miserably mm -hmm. and so sometimes if you go in and you let's say you just bush hog a field and you broadcast your seed you still don't get great seed to soil contact even though you brush hog the field you have a heavy thatch layer and that's why and that's that's laying crisscross yeah. mix matched clumped up and it just is so uneven you can't expect in a to get basically a good clean um organized food plot like yeah. it's it's gonna grow uneven because the thatch is unevenly distributed across that food plot. That's right. Um, I we we're gonna talk about this method of, of you know, spraying a food plot, broadcasting, and then rolling. I know it's gonna come up later in the, in the podcast, but this is one of those instances where if you were to change the order of that basically technique, and you were to spray roll and then broadcast, you would have a heavy thatch layer that your seed is now trying to... Uh, what's what's that game that where like the, the seed tries to like... Plinko? Plinko. That, Plinko. On, uh, price is right. Yeah. yeah. It's like trying to bounce through like the layers and get down to the soil. Um, so that's why it's important in that scenario to broadcast prior to rolling yeah. and allow it to get to the ground and then be protected by that thatch or that vegetation over top of it. Again, we're going to talk about that more in a little bit, um, but understanding that role of that thatch and what it can do, and and sometimes even the seed size itself. You know, if you've got a larger seed, you're trying to um, get down, you know, to the ground level. It's gonna, it might hang up easier, just depending on the type of thatch. But a clover might eventually get down there. Yeah, um, and and, it, and it, even if it's a soybean, it's a bigger seed. You still need to be. It takes more so seed to soil contact for a soybean than it does a clover. Correct. And so that's one thing that even if you get soybean to the surface of the soil, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to germinate. It mm -hmm. needs good contact 
so it can germinate correctly. So which uh, I think this is maybe it's a good time because we're talking about seed to soil contact. Mm -hmm. This is a good time to um, talk about ideal situations, as we've always said, is no-till drilling yeah. using a planter. That is that most ideal situation because you can eliminate a lot of the variables. Now, drought still comes into play, but heavy thatch, um, You're seed cutting soil wheels. contact, yep. all that can be helped and almost prevented, avoided, avoided yeah. all those problems because of using a no-till drill. That's why we are huge advocates of using a no-till drill because you just you rule out a lot of variables that come into play and a lot of variables that are no longer a factor because you've er eliminated them with the no-till drill. So. Yeah, you, you graduate above those common failures by implement, uh, by using that implement and, and say, okay, I don't have to worry about this. Like, I, I have overcome this just by using this no-till drill. This like, piece of equipment. Yeah. I've eliminated the fact that I have to turn the soil and I've eliminated the fact that I have to... Um, I'm not losing to soil moisture. Yep. Yeah, I, I no longer lead. Great. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I put my cr seed in the ground at the correct height yep. or the correct depth. Um, so there's just a lot of things that the no-till drill can really help you out. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we, now we've talked about this broadcast and roll method in these instances of smaller food plots or where you don't have access to a no-till drill uh, or you only have the one quarter acre food plot this is a way to help um, eliminate some more of those variables but it yes. still has its problems mm -hmm. and one of those is that you don't get the best seed to soil contact and if you're on an air if you're in an area where you have bad soil health so your soil is hard it takes a lot of pressure to get that seed to actually go into the soil and and be taken in so it germinates correctly um, we've had problems with this method of, of broadcasting and rolling when we don't have a thatch layer and we don't have enough rain to loosen up the soil to where the seed just sits on top and it can't penetrate the soil because the soil is so hard. Um, and and that is likely the case of having was, dished prior. That was totally 100% the case of... It was self-induced for 10 years of plowing and disking is we eliminated and we've really killed the soil health to where there's not a lot of organic matter. So mm -hmm. uh, did we talk about that scenario? I forget what it was, the brick versus a sponge. We have uh, not discussed okay, on the that, podcast that, yet. So anyway, we're just looking at correct soil. So a healthy great soil yeah. is really more absorbent and can take in moisture and nutrients and flexes, seed as porous. well. And that's why when you walk across like healthy soil, it kind of has that, you know, like when it's rained or whatever, it kind of has a spongy feel. I, I think of Kansas like in the springtime. Like yeah. when you walk, it's it's like a cushion yeah. almost, you know, that you, it's really easy on your knees. Like you can walk miles and miles like, oh, I'm good. Like that soil has like, it almost like breathes. It's like it's a cloud. It's kind of like uh, you know? some of those offices where they're concrete floor, they have mats that are real spongy. Yeah. yeah. And then you have a, where it's not, it's just concrete. That's the difference between healthy soil and, and mm -hmm. bad soil health. So... And that's really kind of once you get healthy soil, you have you you can get away with a lot more in this broadcasting seed. It grows because you have great soil health. But if you have bad soil health after years and years of plowing, you really have to fight hard you, to have a successful crop. You're working a lot now. more input, a <laughs> yes. lot more like as far as fertilizer and lime, a lot more work to actually get the seed to the correct depth. Um, and it's just a, it's a headache that we're trying to help you prevent. Yes, which that covers that. Planting too deep, you mentioned it there, and the, the hassles um, of, of basically turning that soil, going that extra step, it is sometimes very difficult to regulate how deep that soil is, that, that seed is actually getting into soil, especially when you come back and you have to either cult pack or you have to um, use a harrow or you lightly disc a food plot. It's so easier that... That technique is is not precise, basically, yeah. to then say after you broadcast into a disc field and you have to come back and add, you know, turn the soil back over, you, you don't know really what depth. It's going to be uneven. The distribution totally. is like, I could have two inches over here, one inch here, quarter here, just because of the, even the moisture across the field is different, so it's going to clump up different. Like, it's completely, it's, a, it's your hands are up in the air, you're just, it's a guessing game. Yep. when you have to do that yeah. um but like we what we said 
that no-till drill, you, you take that guesswork out of it because you can set the depth, you know, one inch, two inch, and be good. And Quarter inch, not only that, but you can inch. set the calibration of how much seed goes out per acre. Oh, yeah. To where it's just... Like Once you, you, you know exactly what you're doing. It's as simple as just dropping the dropping the uh, no-till drill and driving and letting it go. Yes, um, yes. But when it comes to, it's more guesswork and everything when you go into disking, plowing, broadcasting. And I think of even using like hand spreaders. Um, <laughs> I'll give a short story for you. In using spreaders, um, like your little hand spreaders, I know everybody, almost everybody who's ever planted a food plot has used them at one point or another. And you've gone through with wheat, and you're like, oh, I'll just, I don't want to make four passes around this food plot. I'm going to make two passes. So I'm just going to open up the gauge more. And you're like, just letting her rip. <laughs> and you're throwing the seed out. And then you're like, well, I, I want to add some brassicas to it. So you're like, well, I only want to make one pass or two passes on this. So I'm going to open up a little bit more. And you try, and you think that it's spreading out all nice and even. Well, and then you return a month later and you climb up in the tree stand and, and the food plot's all green, but like it's... It's stripped. It's dark patchy. green over here and then you have real tall brassicas over here to where you just had strips mm-hmm. and f- where basically it's your walking path. And that's a problem when you use the hand spreaders as well. So it's it's very... Mu- you, you have to know what you're doing and, and kind of really understand that just because you're kind of walking through that area doesn't necessarily mean you're getting an even distribution of seed and that's where if you do it too heavy you're ultimately not going to have anything so other than wheat talking about planting too deep uh, this is a, a funny illustration I, I remember from working in maryland we had like an office and and um everyone in the office like i want something kind of pretty to look at so I, we had some like leftover food plot seed and i think um there's some crimson clover or something and uh i'm like oh it's gonna bloom it you know it, it'll be nice Anyhow, planted it, and at that time, um, someone else was had basically prepared it, and they had actually dissed a strip, just a long strip down the driveway, and someone had gone and, and broadcasted the seed, and someone who didn't know what was going on, the, the project, there was basically like a little nursery up there, and they took like one of the UTVs and just accidentally drove across the strip um, that had been planted, like, oh, whoops, whatever, I, what, what's going on here, they didn't know what was planted, um, a week later, what had happened was that only in the tire tracks that that UTV had cut across was where there was green clover growing. Like it, to that degree, it, I was talking about earlier, like had that seed to soil, soil contact. contact, that was the only place that it was successful. Very sporadic in the areas. Maybe if someone walked across with their boot, in that boot print itself, you could see seed or, or, or clover germinating and popping up. But everywhere else, it was a very, very uneven stand. Um, so understanding, you know, the differences between that no-till drill, that single pass that you take across the field versus the disking, then the broadcasting, and then having to come back and cover that seed, you get very different um, distribution of that seed success across the, the, yeah. the food plot. And that's why the cult packer, that's why a lot of people, a use, lot of people use it for that even it back out then, consistently yeah, yeah and for me i like them as the roller and, and yeah. we talked about that it's, I'd two, it's basically twofold for, for packer. Us. yeah so yeah i think that's a, definitely a, a, a failure that people have had oh yeah so yeah um planting seed at the wrong time of the year just yeah. understanding you know we all we all think about you know i want to i want to know um, deer, your your game species that you're going after during the hunting season. I want to know the ins and outs of them, what they need. Um, but we have to understand that to the same degree, the species in a food plot mixture or or a crop that you're trying to have the biggest yield or return. You have to understand that crop very the, the very details of it to be successful, to have the best stand that you can what it likes, what it doesn't like, the best times. So you can't go out and expect to, I think your the notes here say sun hemp in the fall. Like that seed, yeah, sure, you could plant it. And it but, might come up for a little while. Yeah, but, but as soon as it maximized. frosts, boom, it's done. Done, done. Like we, we have to understand that there's a window or a time frame and understand which species work best during this and then match that to, honestly, the landscape 
that the property is in. Like what, what are my nutritional, uh, what am I missing in a, in a diet of a deer or in a turkey? Whatever my goals are. What am I providing in the natural habitat? And then what do I need to supplement that with in the food plot world? And what's my window to do that? Uh, if you're just picking randomly, I, it's not the best or I, I use saw of your this time. Last year, um, when you see spring food plot mixes go on sale at the end of the summer, mm-hmm. and somebody says, man, that's cheap. I'm going to buy that and try it. Well, there's a reason why it's discounted. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then they go out and broadcast some millets and Milo and, yeah. and some uh, soybeans. And it's like August. And you're like, you might get some growth. Well, it only got two and a half foot tall. And, and, and the question was, why why did I see it? Like, why, why is it only this tall? I thought yeah. it was going to get taller. Well, I thought, there's, I thought there was supposed to be a seed head on that thing. You you missed the window <laughs> by about two months. Yeah. And so that's one thing I see a lot where you plant the wrong species or a species at the wrong time of the year. People love clovers for food plots. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, if we haven't educated ourselves enough on this, you may say, oh, it's food plot season. I see guys guys are talking about food plots. I want a clover food plot. I'm going to go plant it. Yeah. And you're planting it in April or May, uh, probably May, and you're like, oh, okay, I planted some clover. Well, that clover grew to be one inch tall or two inches tall. And Came then all in of a sudden, really thick, but then it just disappeared. S- summer hit it and dried it up and killed it. And you're like, what in the world? I planted that clover. It looked good. Well, that's because you planted it at the wrong time of the year. Mm-hmm. And so know what species, what your goal is, and then know what time of the year to plant it. Um, I Sometimes I see soybeans get planted in the fall, which are fine if you have enough of a growing period to where they can grow, deer like them, but you're never going to get pod production if you're no. planting it that late in the fall. And they're extremely attractive, so they will achieve a goal um, of getting deer into a food plot. But right, if you're looking for pod production, you're not going to achieve it then. And, and don't be afraid to ask questions either. No. Um, with you know, is this a good blend? Well, first let's understand the goals that you're trying to achieve in that plot in that area of a farm, and then we could say, yeah, you you're gonna see that um, that food plot be successful when you use this mixture, plant at this rate, this time of the year, and make sure you know you've got plenty of sunshine getting to that food plot. Yeah, and and understand that a seed is is going to ideally germinate at a certain soil temperature. Mm-hmm. So if you're planting a, a soil, t- a seed that takes whatever, let's say corn, 60, corns at 60 degree degrees, soybean soil 60. temperature, yep. and you plant it when the, soil, when the soil is extremely hot, you're not given its best case scenario for survival. So you have a seed that's now surviving and not thriving. Yes. And yep. so every time you go with surviving and not thriving, you're, you're losing money. Mm-hmm. And so we're just we're here trying to help you avoid losing lots and lots of money and wasting lots and lots of time in your food plot world. Just yeah, seeing success in in the time that you take to do the work. You want to be successful. You want to hunt over these food plots. And again, like you said, they are especially if you have bad soil. You need to put a lot of inputs into the soil to get a decent crop or get a crop period out of some areas that are selected and i think that's another one that honestly we don't have on here is poor food plot area selection you're just choosing an a horrible place to put a food plot and say hey i i'm i'm expecting something to grow here so site index is another one that we need to add because how many places have we gone to that's just always wet it's oh it's an open area but it's always wet and we talked about that 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 goes with the whole drought talk is Mm -hmm. because you're preparing that soil to not hold soil moisture you also if you're plowing and disking you're breaking up the porous factor of that soil to where now water just sits on it and it doesn't infiltrate through the through the soil profile so it goes from one extreme to the other and that's Mm -hmm. why you almost think of like deserts deserts go really hot to really cold at night Mm -hmm. same thing can happen with soil you go from really dry to really wet and Mm -hmm. healthy soil is should always be moist, but not too dry, too wet. In, in our area, we, we commonly see, because they're halfway open already, or should be, glades. And yeah. a lot of people are trying to plant these glades that are very shallow soil, rocky, and get beat by the sun south, 
southwest facing slopes and those areas even though they're open and and don't have you don't have to cut down as many trees probably to have a food plot per se the success there is going to be limited um based on the condition the index of that site so be mindful of that when you're selecting an area understand the goals for that that portion of the the farm and if that site can't do it don't yeah. expect much and, and or, basically in simple terms if that site is not ideal for soybeans it's going to take a lot of fertilizer and lime to get those soybeans to flourish the way you expect them to. So you have to look at it and say, is, I guess this is a stupid term, but is the juice worth the squeeze? That's it. Is it worth all that money to get it there? Or should you look at some other situation or other location to plant soybeans and let that be something else? And that's the great thing. This is my plug for natives. Mm. That's the great thing about native species that if they, if the soil hasn't been just disturbed or basically destroyed. If there's still a native seed bank there. A a native soil type too, as far as you haven't done a lot of damage to it, is the natives are are able to flourish without all those inputs. That's what I love about native grasses and wildflowers is the fact that the natives don't take all that fertilizer and lime to have them grow every single year. And then you look at tall fescue and it takes a lot of fertilizer and lime to get it to be as productive as those um, native grasses um, just because they're not adapted to that soil. So there's my little plug for you on that. So, so another thing to, to be mindful, but kind of touched on it is just blends that don't make sense. Blends that have seeds that shouldn't be associated with one another that don't um, help achieve the goal that there's a lot of marketing schemes out there, I guess, when it comes to food plots there and really? mixes. There are. I didn't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just that's why educating yourself on on each seed, on each species, um, and understanding those environments. It's important to know that not every blend out there is a good blend or just a blend that's mixed it, well. Just because it has a buck on the bag doesn't mean it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's so I think true. Of, when you and when you see a and try to understand what species are for certain times of the year so like there's species that should be planted in the spring early summer some should be planted in the fall um late summer and when you see some of those get mixed you should automatically go okay why are they mixed like mm-hmm. what's the goal here and if or, it or doesn't right. have a, a specific goal that makes sense it's probably a filler blend where you have species uh that are Great, sure. That's a, that's a good species to be planting at that time of the year. But why is this one in here? That's probably just a filler seed. Things to steer clear of is terms like year-round nutrition provided in this bag. Yeah. Don't buy it. <laughs> yeah. Please or don't. certainly do more research. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a very bold statement when it comes to a blend offering that much Especially Forage. if there's not many species in that blend. Now, if oh, it's yeah. got a, a bunch of species and you look at it, you're like, okay, there's all kinds of stuff. This one fills this window. This one fills this window. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, I can get by with that. But if it's not a lot of species in that blend and it says year-round, then whoop, red flag, probably not probably yes. not what you're looking for. Yes, so just be cautious of that. And, and just, again, educate yourself. Avoid those mistakes. Bad seed germination. Um, and that immediately we, we talk about the storage of the seed. How has it been stored in an off season um, for you to have great seed germination when you actually put that seed in the ground, whether yes. it's too hot or too cold? Um, I think it's sometimes when you, you have seed left over and you're like, oh, I'll just store it for next year and big seed like a soybean. Oh, I didn't plant all that. I'm going to store it. And you just store mm-hmm. it out in the barn and that barn goes from... <laughs> 80, 20. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I said 80, but let's say it goes to 110 in the summer and yeah. bakes in there, and then it go, drops down to teens or single digits in the winter. It's probably not going to have a great germination. No. And so then you have to account for it, and you're just guessing most likely what the germination is, and then you go out and plant it. So you may have spots where you're like, boy, it, it looks like only 60% came up. Well, it probably happened probably because so, of the storage and you didn't account for that germination to where you planted at a higher rate to where you could actually get the ideal pounds per acre you're expecting 95 percent, but in reality because of that 
you're, you're really getting 60% and you got yes. a lot of holes to fill in yeah. that food plot. So definitely understand that and know where your seed comes from and read the label. Read a label. I think that might be one of the next ones, is it? Is, yeah, understanding pure live seed and what that percentage means in a food plot blend. And what the difference is between pure live seed count and the population count that they're recommending for a specific seed to be planted at per acre. And so a population is going to be the exact number of seeds that goes into one acre of planting. And understanding what that is, because each year, based on conditions um, experienced in you know, growing conditions, whether it's a hot year, a dry year, a wet year, the seed sizes, a soybean seed is going to vary each year based on that growing season. So the population count will then fluctuate from year to year. And so your seeding rate is going to change from maybe 100,000 to 120,000 from year to year. So you just have to be conscientious of what that is based on that seed and that seed taken from the year prior when it comes to population. And then understanding pure live seed count versus the percentage of that seed in a mixture. So if you if you have 25% um, clover. Our, oh, clo- okay. I was going to say 25% clover. Let's say you've got, let's just make, make it really easy. Four different species and your um, pure live seed count is not going to add up to the total weight of the entire bag because you have things like... Um, a seed coat on some of those blends or inoculation inoculation on those, on those specific seeds. So yeah, your overall weight is going to be 50 pounds in that bag, but your pure live seed may only be 38 to 40 pounds in that seed. So you're, you have to account for the 38 pounds, not the total 50 pounds. That's the bag is saying it's a 50 pound bag, but your total seed count really is around 38. So that factors into your planting rate for that field, if that makes sense. You have to account for the additives onto that seed. That's pure live seed versus population. So, and then you brought up the inner matter. Yeah. You I, see I, that I, number thrown in there. What, what, what is this? Matter? Yeah, oh, or, oh. or like uh, you see a, a label that says 40 pounds and, and 30 pounds is... The seed, or or the seed makes up 80 percent of the mm-hmm. bag, and you're like, okay, and then ten percent is inert matter, and you're like, what in the world? It's it's important that you understand how much seed you're actually getting in a Correct. bag. Correct. Correct. That's going to affect. And then that goes into. Rate. I think there was a great article on QDMA about that. On on then that actually go should be taken into how many pounds per acre you're planting, not just going. Well, here's a forty pound bag. Blah, yeah. It's this per acre. Well, Same thing with that pure live seed count. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, be conscious of that. Read the tag. Understand what that tag means, and you'll see PLS on a seed tag. That's pure live seed. And then you might see a recommendation for population, uh, whether it's you know a, a bigger grain like your uh, like a wheat or a corn or a soybean. That's going to be the number of seeds per acre that they recommend that year. Um, so understanding that to get good germination, eva- avoid bad seed germination. Herbicide problems is the next one. You know, herbicide treatments are so common when you're preparing a plot or maintaining a plot. Um, but there's so many, it's, it's a deep understanding of the, the chemistry that goes in to the herbicide work to terminate an exact species or exact type of plant, whether it be a broadleaf or a grass but understanding what each herbicide, its target, and the way it terminates plants, yeah. critical. Yeah, and I think, once again, read the label. We could try and break all this down, but there's so many herbicides out there for so many different applications. <laughs> that it, it's that's just 10 easier. podcasts. That's not one got, podcast. That's 10, 10 probably. 10 podcasts, and by 9, everybody's like, shut up about herbicides. <laughs> yeah. And so we're just going to tell you, read the label and look for the residual effects um, on that. 
Mm-hmm. So the the example that I have, the story I have for this is um, spraying out a species, a broadleaf with like 2,4-D or some sort of broadleaf herbicide and thinking, okay, that's done. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to plant my species. And you go back in and you plant some sort of broadleaf and you're like, okay, yeah, it's all good. It's I, I sprayed that. Now everything's done. Um, and that species, let's just say I sprayed out a bunch of broad leaves and cl- some clovers. I wanted to try and kill off the clover that was there because it was more of a weed than, than actual beneficial. Then I went back with a broad leaf and brassicas and I planted them and they came up germinating. I thought, okay, it's great. And then all of a sudden they turn yellow. Well, there was a, there was still active herbicide in that soil. There was residual effects from that herbicide. So that's definitely something to consider when you are using herbicides on your food plots. That's a, it's a huge thing, if, especially if you get a farmer who has used commercial and larger amounts and done a broad spectrum um, controlling weeds in his crop fields, and then you say, hey, can I, can I plant this portion? That's a big window, um, but some of the, the herbicides that sterilize the ground basically last weeks and months yeah. throughout a growing season. So it's not just a, a week or, or a couple days when it comes to potentially converting cropland into food plot land. So understand, you might have to call that farm and be like, hey, did you spray anything this year that I need to be you know aware of before I plant? Understand that. So you could just avoid wasting time and money on food plots. And know what type of, uh, here's another one for you, uh, using Tordon RTU to treat some locusts and know that and, and this story is I saw where somebody had told basically that you could foliar treat with Tordon RTU. Do. Don't do it. Please Oof. don't. And they foliar treated these little honey locust saplings growing. They were like one and two foot tall. They sprayed them out in the food plots. And all of a sudden the soybeans next to it started mm-hmm. dying. And there was this ring in the, in the outside of the ring where the soybeans are still growing. They looked like they'd gotten sprayed with herbicide and they were all Stunted. gnarly and nasty. Yep. So it's definitely important to know what herbicide you're using and what the ground, how ground af- active it is, what the residual effects are, and what your long-term goals are for that for that uh, piece of ground. And and then that goes back to mixes too. If you have a lot of grasses and broadleafs mixed in together, you can't really find a great herbicide most times to effectively treat weeds. No, in I- that pl- in that plot and understanding. And identifying weeds specifically will save you so much money down the road when it comes to selecting the right herbicide yeah. to use. Because you, how many times do we talk to people, clients, or just uh, people we come in contact with, hey, I got grasses in my clover plot, but I, I've sprayed them with clethodim and, and they're not dying. Well, they might not be a grass. It's Maybe. probably a sedge. Or but, a rush. Yeah. Identifying that weed on the front end would have saved you so much money and time. So don't be afraid to be a, a plant ID nerd. It will help you out. Buy sure. those books. We should find the books that we recommend and put them in the show notes as yes, well. That's a great idea. Um, because there are so many things out there to learn on, and, and understand as far as sedges. And, and that was something I struggled with early on. And that brings up another point about um, putting food plots in areas that maybe not should yes. not have is when you see a lot of sedges and things coming up that's probably a pretty good indicator wet that there's a feet. wet uh there's wet soil there and so you can't plant something that can't take wet feet there as well um what was the other thing i was going to say here and i cannot remember so let's clean just... out the sprayer yes i i've heard i used to uh work at a golf course when i was growing up played golf in college and spent a lot of time there but there's horror stories of a a, a basically they rented a sprayer to spray greens and they had not cleaned out the sprayer tank from the golf course who had rented it prior and they did not understand the herbicide that they had used in the tank so the first couple greens that they ended up spraying killed them killed them yeah you talk about a bad day wow bad bad day but clean out the sprayer it doesn't. It, that's just routine maintenance talk. Anyhow, whenever you're done, herbicides are like they're made out of salt, so they're corrosive. So you have got to clean those out um, after you're done using them, or you'll see build up rust residue from year to year. But just clean it out, especially if you're changing the herbicides. And and if it has a motor, 
as well. Yeah, that's one the bad pump, thing. Everything. The pump, everything. It's yep. just bad. Like glyphosate rough is on them. horrible on on <clears throat> like uh, pump filters and and uh, they can just flat eat up some rubber. Mm-hmm. And so just make sure you get them cleaned out. But I remember what it was now on food plot failures. We haven't talked about this, but clover food plot failures. So another thing is weeds. I know weeds is in here, mm-hmm. right? Um, yes. We'll save it for them then. Okay. Um, that covers herbicide problems. Seed protection. And this, we talked about, you know, yeah. using a no-till drill, just getting that seed directly into the ground, Problem avoiding solved. that mistake, or avoiding, you know, the potential for the mistake of not having a cover or a um, vegetation over top of the um, the seed that you broadcasted. So what's something that can consume that seed? Birds. Oh, yeah. How many times? Birds like, and squirrels. Squirrels will carry and, like, I, I, gosh, what... what Oh, we were we were planting one year, and like the next couple days after we planted, and it was really rocky ground. Um, we kept seeing so many squirrels just making trips and trips and trips back and forth, back and forth, storing up and and basically burying this seed to have it for late winter. Yeah. And it, but it was a serious problem. Crows are horrible. Doves are horrible. Blackbirds are horrible. Robin, any type of stinking bird, turkeys can wipe out a food plot if you have seed just laying on top of the ground. Yeah. It's so easy. It's a meal ticket. It's a buffet. So how do we combat that? We like to do the broadcast roll method. And existing vegetation and food plot, roll and lay that over top of the seed that you've broadcasted. It does wonders for protecting the soil, all that. But quite frankly, just practicality, reality is, it protects the seed. It it does not allow the sun to just damage it, overheat it, um increases the germination rate but birds is so much harder for them to pick through and find it yeah we like to no-till drill or that sure method. so uh, basically in a roundabout or in simple terms we like to keep the soil uh, the soil and seed covered there's mm-hmm. armor for the soil and there's armor for the seed yes and that's the biggest way we can combat because if we're we're basically hiding the seed from the birds and the animals by mm-hmm. having some sort of thatch or cover crop um, laid over to give the soil armor and protect that seed from being eaten. But we also know germination is not going to be quite as high when we broadcast, and we are still going to lose some to birds. We're still going to lose some to squirrels. Um, so we bump up a seeding rate, 15 20% typically, in those areas, in those instances when we're broadcasting yep. to combat that. So... Heavy rains also can wash away seed that's uh, unprotected. I see Erosion. this a lot with frost seeding clovers. Uh, a lot of times we frost seed that clover four to five before the last four to five frost. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you broadcast that, uh, we did the, I did this one year to where we broadcast and they were calling for a half inch of rain and all of a sudden it kept raining and raining and raining. And when we had uh, germination, a couple weeks later, we had lots of green and little piles <laughs> on the bottom side of the food plot because yep. it had gotten washed off. How what? many times, like in the early spring, you see a farmer who's gone and planted corn and eat, got it like inch and a half, <clears throat> two inches deep? Excuse me. He's getting real emotional about <coughs> it. Oh, woo! Um, but then you get those heavy rains and you get these channels, these washouts across these fields, and you see corn on either side of that ditch or channel but in that that stream there is no yeah. corn yeah. it does not grow yeah it is washed away so being conscious of that and one way a couple ways you can combat that is always having armor on the soil having something to help keep down erosion um so if you've disc and plowed or plowed and disc you are way more susceptible for drought losing moisture but also erosion and having your soil and big seed time. washed away big time so that's why no-till drilling and keeping armor on the soil, keeping something growing Active will root always system. win in, yep. in this fight. Okay, we covered it earlier, um, planting too early, too late. Yeah. The seed is triggered by the temperature yeah. of the soil. And so you could plant too early, it germinates, you get hit with a cold spell, it kills it. So that's yep. where you wouldn't go out and plant soybeans in March or February because you wanted to have, instead of having four foot tall beans, you want to have eight foot. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't work it like that. doesn't work like that. <laughs> there are no shortcuts. So no. you need to know what 
time frame is best, and that way you don't plant too early or too late. Like if you planted corn in July or August and it needed a certain amount of days to mature, you're not going to have an ear. You may get a stock, but you won't have the ear. Yep. So that's why it's important to plant at the right time of the year. Correcto. Now what do we have? Poor soil health. We've talked about it, the ways you can you know, basically have poor soil health, the ways we can damage it. Um, but we're talking a little bit like very small amounts of organic matter in the soil. Um, that's the glue. This is a whole other podcast, but that makes soil healthy. It retains moisture in the soil. It makes things work. Um, but if you've damaged that, if you destroyed that, if you don't have that, your success, again, is going to be limited. You have to amend it, amend the soil, put nutrients back into it um, to basically band-aid each year yes. each season get that crop to bakes basically have some sort of yield um and you could do it with the with the amendments but it just costs more money yeah. if you take care of that soil you don't have to put those in each and every year just mind your soil it's a resource manage it appropriately um so it's lacking soil nutrients take the soil sample understand um what it is that you need to do. Each crop itself, again, we talked about it, is different in its needs. Clover is really heavy on phosphorus. If you're low on um, phosphorus count in a place that you want to establish clover, put phosphorus in. Um, Understand that that is a legume, so you might be a little bit lower on nitrogen, but in a couple of years, you're going to build it back up. Understanding that process and reading soil samples um, to make the appropriate decisions is super important. That was the thing that I was going to say earlier that I was going to touch on in mm-hmm. clover failures was a lot of times you see this like, oh, well, after four years, it, it went away. I had too many. That three weeds. to four year window, people are like, oh, I'm fed up with this clover. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm constantly mowing weeds. Well, the problem is you, you're planting a monoculture of legumes with clover. So it's doing nothing but fixating nitrogen and putting nitrogen back into the soil. But then you don't have anything, you're not putting anything in that soil to take that nitrogen out. That way, that's whenever you have that's a when the little weeds open say. spot and the weeds take over. Nature is just trying to put arm on the soil. So you get a bare soil and all of a sudden there's a weed seed there. It germinates and it grows super quick. And you're like, why? Well, it has an abundance of nitrogen um, in the soil that it it's has able a to fertilized tap into. food plot. It has a fertilized food and plot sunlight. that it just grows like crazy. And that's why after four years, you have four years of nitrogen fixation and an abundance of overabundance an overabundance of nitrogen in the soil so the way to combat that is to plant diversity Woo-hoo. so in the in the fall you can drill in wheat notes um and help tap into that nitrogen so now you're going to have a great nurse crop for that clover but you're also going to have more food for the wildlife and it's going to help fight the weeds over time. So ideal situations, every year you have a clover food plot. That fall you plant wheat or oats or some type of um, cereal grain to help take that nitrogen out of the soil. So Bingo. there you go. Um, Liming. I think it, this is one of those things where uh, so many studies have, seen, have shown that liming it takes six to seven months for that lime to fully incorporate itself and change the, the soil chemistry to help neutralize things, get things back to a, a healthy pH. Um, but that's a long time frame. So if you need to to lime your soil, don't lime it in, in let's say, March, plant in April, and think that your soil chemistry and pH balance is good to go. It takes time for that to fully work and incorporate itself um, to again change that chemistry and balance things back out. So understanding that soil um, science, understanding the soil sample, reading it, and making the amendments amendments at the appropriate basically size, how much you need in there, but then at the right times too. It's another thing too to know that too much. That what was the phrase I used at the beginning? More is not always best. Yeah. Especially with this as well, lime and fertilizers. If you put a ton of if you think, oh, the recommended, the soil sample says 100 pounds of fertilizer, uh, whatever it is, and you're like, well, 200 will be better, probably not the case. So follow the directions mm-hmm. accordingly. Um, Woo! <clears throat> lack of weed control. Uh, this is a bigger one. Yeah. Um, but just not, not taking the time, I think, to properly understand the seed bank, to understand the mixture, 
that you or the blend that you're planting, how to go about controlling weeds, whether you need to do a really good job up front or if it's Roundup ready. Planting um, the same thing over and over and over and yep. over is not ideal either. No, because those the seeds that are there, the, the weed seeds, they will build up a resistancy in your food plots to the herbicide because they keep getting hit every single year. And so they're getting stronger and stronger and stronger to basically not be terminated by that herbicide. So no. you might need to switch up the herbicide that you use, which may mean you need to switch the um, crop that you're planting to, to basically terminate and stop those weeds that are getting resistant. I think of Zach's family farm, um, Oh, pigweed. They, yeah, they had a pigweed that was getting resistant to glyphosate. So we had to make the recommendation to say, okay, instead of planting Roundup Ready soybeans, we're going to switch it up, and you ought to plant Liberty Link soybeans and use a different herbicide. What was it? Like Inferno or something like that? Uh, uh, yeah. so it's something flame, something name. That's how I remember it. But a different herbicide to uh, for a couple years to I'll read basically the label. <laughs> fight back that pigweed that had gotten resistant to glyphosate had to change it up same crop but different um, herbicide to combat those things so understanding what's in the seed bank the best way to control it and the best time frame too when it comes to uh, terminating weeds earliest is best because they can get very tough make seed don't well don't make seed and once they get a really good root system they can be darn right tough to kill yeah go through those one more time in a nutshell we're going to do a wrap up for you so failures and food plotting drought drought no soil moisture you're you're damaging that by either disking um not protecting that soil um as a resource or you miss rains you you miss the time frame to successfully uh, in your area it's different for every area but to plant and have good soil moisture. You don't pay your preacher enough. That's what I was heard. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't, num- do, you don't rain dance enough. What, what's the number two? Um, overseeding food plots. Planting not, too thick. Yeah. Poor seed to soil contact. That one speaks for itself. The yeah. next one, planting too deep. Um, planting seed at the wrong time of the year. Not understanding that seed, what it needs, and understanding um, the best times to plant those seeds. Bad seed germination. Another one speaks for itself. You could say um, too hot or too cold. You may have weevils. We didn't we didn't discuss that. They get into older seed. You're not storing it properly. You're not understanding pure live seed count or population count um, in that seed mixture, that bag. You might be buying herbicide problems, resistancy, um, residuals, or you're not cleaning out a sprayer can often lead to failed food plots. Um, protecting the seed once it is planted, whether you have a no-till drill, you're getting into the right depth, covering it back up with a packing wheel or a cult packer. Um, Or if you're broadcasting, you're not having a thatch or vegetation layer lay back over top of it. You can easily experience um, a food plot failure or heavy rains washing seed away, planting again too early or too late. Or soil health is just out of whack. You've done your soil test and it comes back. You have very little organic matter, um, your soil nutrients. You're deficient in this. You have too much of this. The um, pH levels are way off. You just need to understand that and make the proper amendments to get it balanced for each specific crop or food plot species you are trying to plant. Um, and then weed control. There you have it. Boy, that, that hour went by fast. Yeah, it did. I mean, um, really fast. Shoot, we're at an hour and eight minutes. Would you rather? Yeah. Who is it brought by this week? Who's doing that? Deer Lab. Deer Lab. Mm. Man, I... I, just we haven't that, talked about it a whole lot, but don't you worry, it's coming. It is coming because that software is stinking incredible. It's just we're, we're turkey in the turkey mind frame right now. We are turkey Full and food plots point. and prescribed fire. But as soon as and we've been using it for a couple of years now. Yeah, and so you will see us talking about it more because it's an awesome software it's program awesome for organiz- organizing, but also understanding kind of what's going on with your trail cameras on your property so um would you rather brought to you by deer lab this week matt would you rather let's hear it uh and i'm just going i was just thinking about this while we did the podcast but i'm going to ask you would you rather if you have a brand new one acre cleared food plot just cleared out of the timber would you rather plant 
a blend or of some sort of whatever? Um, or would you rather plant a soybean food plot? It would me. It's a very loaded question. It is a loaded question, but I, I'm going. I'm sticking to this answer. Year one, I would like to plant a Roundup Ready soybean so I can help control the weeds and the seed bank that might be there. Um, so it's going to allow me to get an extra herbicide application. I can get one before I plant um, to get those first weeds that come up, kill those out, and then as I plant and get the later um, weeds that come into you know, June, July time frame before those soybeans canopy back over, I can hit those with another herbicide application and not um, interfere with the forage that I need growing in that plot. Once I have that done year one, I feel confident. I, I've got, you know, the seed bank somewhat under control in this specific area. Then I start getting really creative into the blends and, and what my edges may look like. And, you know, it, it's going to change years down the road. Yeah. Year one, soybean. Yeah. Okay. This is a this is a different would you rather. So get ready to think on this one. Would you rather lose a hitless buck each year during deer season or lose two two and a half year olds that you see potential in? <laughs> I, I take You're the, not winning in either one. I'll but take the two. Uh that would hurt me more. That would the two two and a half year olds would hurt yeah, you more. I would rather see a neighbor kill a hit lister. Yeah. Every year, then see two every year. Go ah, that gummit. Where'd that the one go? The unknown is what kills me on that one. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That's it. I like. That's I me. like it. That's a good yeah. answer. Anyway, I like. I like seeing other people be successful in killing mature deer. That's what everyone's after. It's a trophy. So if we can share that, um, I think that's that's a great great answer. For sure. All right. That's um, pretty well. You got anything? Yeah. Hey, it's turkey season. We had a great week. We're we're three days into the season and have got two kills on footage, on film, exceptional hunts that will be um, part of film number three. And we've gotten a heck heck of a season going, and uh, we're just getting started. So that's something to look forward to. For sure. All right. I just got a a cool picture that a friend sent me. It's a trail camera scenario. It's a Tom strutting around a bunch of hens, or a couple of hens, and all of a sudden you see her lay down Squat. on the ground and he breeds her right there in front of oh, the show wow. camera that's so, awesome pretty cool but anyway that pretty well wraps up this week's land of legacy podcast we hope you guys enjoyed it we'll catch you next time see ya thanks for listening to another episode of land of legacy's hunting and habitat management podcast if you like what you hear check us out at landlegacy.tv you can submit a viewer question right there and we're answering on the podcast or find us on facebook and instagram Feels pretty good knowing that from the beginning of time, God has called us to be a caretaker, a gamekeeper, a manager of the land. So with that being said, don't you think we should do it all for the love of the land and the glory to God?